I am part of the coordinating uh, team of Tigre. Uh, Tigre su supports this series of online seminars. And uh, Tigre is a research consor consortium on trust in governance and regulation in Europe, which is funded by the European Union Horizon 2020 uh, uh, program. So let me first thank warmly uh, Professor David Levy Four, from uh, who is the lead organizer of uh, these webinars, and who kindly invited me for, well, for organizing them first, and then for inviting me to chair and moderate today's session. Uh, so today I we have the privilege and the the honor to introduce. I will do it very briefly. Um, Professor Victor Lapuente. Victor is an associate professor at the Department of Political Science and a research fellow at the Quality Govern of Government Institute of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, he's also a visiting professor at uh, the ESADE Business School in Barcelona. Uh, he received his PhD uh, in political science from the University of Oxford and the Juan March Institute in, Ma in Madrid. Uh, his research is mainly in the field of comparative public administration, and he's in an, an internationally renowned expert on uh, the quality of government. Well, apart from many articles in major academic uh, journals, uh, Victor Apuente is the author, together with uh, Karl Dahlström, of uh, Organizing Leviathan, How the Relations Between Politicians and Bureaucrats Shape Good Government, uh, published with Cambridge University Press uh, in uh, 2017. Uh, so today, uh, Victor will talk on, will give a talk on uh, trust, polarization, and uh, excess mortality for COVID-19 across European regions. Well, this is obviously, uh, this is no doubt a highly topical issue. Um, uh, before giving the floor to, to Victor, um, I would like to invite the participants to use the, the chat function to note if they have a question, because I cannot see you all uh, on, on, my, on my screen. So now Victor has the floor for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have about the same time for the uh, Q&A session. Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yanis, um, for your kind words. Thank you very much, uh, David and Yasin, for, for inviting me. It's an honor uh, and a pleasure to talk uh, before such a distinguished uh, audience on, on experts on, on, on this topic. And um, let me share um, the, uh, the screen. And I'm going to see if I if you can see the uh, if you can see the full screen i guess so uh, you can see it um, well yeah yes so yes i'm going to i'm going to talk about uh, this uh, work that i have done with uh, my colleague in gothenburg uh, nicolas charron um, and andres rodriguez pose at the lse too, polar too much polarization may kill you, trust, polarization, and excess mortality for COVID-19 across European regions. Uh, this is much uh, work in the making, but, uh, but, um, uh, by our, but we are mostly analyzing, we are restricting our analysis to the first wave of uh, uh, COVID-19. So uh, if, uh, if, if, we, if we wonder, uh, from a political science of view, political science point of view, what what has happened uh, in the government response against um, um, COVID nineteen? Um, we could say that this this uh, sentence of of Pasteur that science knows no country because it is the light that illuminates the world. Basically, what we have seen is that actually science seems to know more some countries more than others. In some one, some countries, they seem to have followed more scientific advice, while in others they have been uh, following more uh, politicized, let's say, uh, um, um, decisions uh, when it comes to fight the pandemic. So 
expert recommendations to control the spread of the virus uh, regarding social distancing, regarding staying at home, seem to have been adopted to a far larger extent by some governments than by others, and followed more by some societies than others. And we are wondering uh, um, uh, why. That is, that is would be the, the, um, the driver of the uh, uh, what uh, mm, uh, the reason why we, we were concerned about this and why we decided to write this paper. The puzzle that we address is why some territories, not so much countries, but territories we are focusing on European regions have performed better than others in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, the caveat, uh, of course, is too early to call <laughs> and some of the conclusions might, we may might have now we might change them uh, in 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 a, in a few months, but we are focusing on the first wave, uh, not now on the second wave. So the first wave, uh, basically weeks one until week twenty two, at the end uh, of uh, of May. What is performance? I think most of the re uh, research has focused on, and I think it's uh, comprehensible. Have focused on government outputs, for example, the extent. Uh, to which governments have adopted anti-contagion measures such as school and workplace closures, uh, restrictions on mobility, cancellations of public events or, or, or public information campaigns. And we are um, focusing more on outcomes and on the large outcome, which is whether people die or, or not in the region, uh, or if the people die or not, uh, during the pandemic. That doesn't mean that they die because of COVID-19, but we think that from a moral point of view, it doesn't matter so much whether people are dying due to COVID-19 or due to the fact that the healthcare system is not able to handle uh, patients with a heart attack uh, or, uh, or with a cancer due to the fact that they are collapsed because of COVID-19. So what our dependent variables, we look at the total deaths by region in Europe, in 153 European regions between these uh, first five months of the, of the year. And we compare it with the average deaths by region for the years, uh, for the five previous years, 2015, 2019. And what we see is a huge variation across regions, a variation that uh, um, outweighs a lot, actually, uh, the differences between countries. So the difference within countries, within regions are much larger than across countries. You, you can see in Madrid, uh, it, uh, the probability of dying increases 75% or the excess, the, the deaths in the, in the region exceed 75% uh, in 2020 in comparison to the five previous years, but within the same country, the Balear Islands, and. Uh, uh, in, in, in Spain or, or in Galicia, actually it was better to be during these first months uh, of 2020 than in the five previous years when it comes to the probabilities of, of dying. So it was, it was lower uh, the, the, the average uh, death during those, the, those uh, months. And the same in Italy and all over you find uh, um, differences uh, uh, within countries that are far larger the differences in excess mortality across 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 countries what we uh, what we uh, analyze is first of all we built on the existing literature and the existing literature have pointed out two factors uh, um, um, uh, of course uh, the most important factor to fight uh, it would be medicines are vaccines but since they are not available so far it seems to be key uh, um, human behavior, how people behave seems to be key to contain the pandemic. And that behavior of humans seems to depend quite a lot on two variables. One would be the idea of social trust, social responsibility of citizens have been found a strong association actually between the levels of social trust in, 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 in regions or in counties in the US or or across countries uh, and the higher option of healthy and pro-social behavior, such as uh, reduction of mobility or more social distancing in the, in the regions. Also trusting government in the very first weeks of the, of the pandemic, actually Fukuyama wrote one of his, uh, one of those articles that he writes with very nice insights, no data, but very interesting insights. 
and saying that probably trust in government would be key uh, to understand which countries perform better uh, with uh, against uh, COVID. And actually, some papers uh, have found a strong association as well between trust in government and higher adoption of health and prosocial behavior remind that they look at these kind of outputs and not the outcomes of excess mortality, uh, um, that the dependent variables are slightly different than, than ours, but they find some effects. But uh, also has not been, uh, it has not been uh, found uh, as significant for others, for example, for for explaining uh, voluntary compliance. So actually there seems to be, so there seems to matter trust in government, and maybe it matters in interaction with other things. So it doesn't seem to matter so directly. And that is also one of the reasons that uh, led us to, um, to uh, do this, this paper. From our point of view, a point of view that we have explored slightly a little bit in previous research, uh, Nicolas and Nicolas Charron and I, we are not so much concerned about the importance of the levels of trust, but we are particularly concerned about the variations in trust within the, the population. So we think that would, uh, again, might be key here uh, is not so much how many people trust government, which might matter as well, uh, that matters. But apart from that, it's also how different people trust uh, uh, government. So, so if if uh, if people because they are Democrats or they are Republicans, they might trust uh, government uh, differently, and that might have an 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 an, an effect. I mean, we we can see that in the in the in the US i mean people who are democrats uh, they seem to use and there are studies showing that they use the face mask uh, to a larger extent than those who are um, um, republicans uh, so so th that that might matter those variations and this points out to to uh, to our two uh, main uh, main variables we we think that um, uh, what we call um, uh, mass polarization. So up, up to which extent there is a polarization in the attitudes in the, in the population, they might, that might have an effect on, uh, on uh, fighting against the, the pandemic. How we measure, how we interpret mass polarization? Well, if the supporters of government trust the government a lot and the, the opponents of government do not trust the government. So, so we, 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 if that there is a large difference between those groups, we might assume there is a polarization in the society, and that polarization of the society might lead to the fact that those who support the government, they put the face mask and do those sort of recommendations, while those who oppose the government actually actively, it's not that they don't do, do it, but actually sabotage these, uh, these uh, measures and recommendations. But we also think that elite polarization matters, not only mass polarization. So of course, if a society is divided, it's gonna be much more difficult than the people are following all of them, the recommendations, but also in order to enact and decide those recommendations in the first place, in many cases for states, for, for taking uh, tough decisions such as curfews and states of alarms and so on, governments need the collaboration of the opposition. If, if the parties are highly polarized at the, in the parliament, it is difficult to, to agree. We are gonna have, uh, have also more, uh, more, uh, more problems and the fight against uh, the, the response of the government is gonna be worse. On, under those cases. So we actually consider that there are three mechanisms through which a elite polarization might lead to a worse performance uh, in the fight against COVID. The first one is, is this one uh, that I was mentioning a little bit now. Um, if you don't, if the opposition is very polarized with the government, the opposition doesn't want to work together with the government to start with, it's gonna be very difficult to take those unpopular but necessary tough measures, such as, for example, states of alarm. And in many cases, actually even legally, govern, not only from a, an accountability point of view, but also legally, governments need the support of the opposition to take uh, unpopular uh, measures. And 
One example would be uh, from Spain, but that has happened in many countries that governments, basically almost all countries, have declared states of emergency of, or a states of, of alarm. And one of the reasons, according to the economists, why Spain has performed poorly during this summer is that uh, after having a very strict uh, lockdown during, during, during the spring in Spain, the, the highly polarized Spanish parliament was unable to support the socio-democrat uh, prime minister in uh, uh, expanding the state of alarm. So uh, uh, rebuffed uh, Mr. Sanchez, the Spanish prime minister, handed control of the pandemic to the regions that um, implied an opening of the economy and the society. And that, uh, uh, according to the economists and according as well to many experts, uh, facilitated the, the, the emergence of this horrible, this huge second wave uh, in Spain in, uh, in, recent, in recent months. So polarization might be behind the inability of governments to take decisions that are necessary. That would be the first mechanism. But there is a, uh, there is a, a, a second mechanism, which would be that in a highly polarized uh, environment, it's more likely that governments, instead of, let's say, trying to please a large, uh, uh, the large public, the, the, a large group uh, of social groups, maybe in a highly polarized environment, they might prefer to appeal to their core constituencies' short-sighted interests. So maybe instead of following scientific advice on what is better for this whole society, uh, maybe governments in a highly polarized might prioritize the narrower interest of core uh, constituencies. So again, I'm gonna use examples from Spain and one example, let's say criticizing the core uh, interest of the left uh, government and national level, and another example criticizing how uh, the regional government in Madrid, uh, remember the, the region worst uh, hit by the, by the pandemic in Europe and one of the worst hit in, in, in the world, uh, the Madrid regional government, right-wing government was uh, following or pleasing mostly uh, its core constituency. So it's not an ideological question, uh, it's, uh, it's a question of following your core uh, constituency's interest in, in critical moments over uh, the, uh, well, over scientific, uh, scientific advice, what the scientists and the technocrats were advising to do at every, every, every moment. So, so would you, the example, uh, it has an it, it has had a certain inter, international repercussion, and is the fact that uh, on March the eighth, uh, International uh, Women's uh, Day, there were uh, demonstrations in Spain with hundreds of thousands. Um, probably in 2019, there was no country in the world with larger demonstrations uh, with millions. Actually, in that case of of women demonstrating in the in the streets, and then the government uh, allowed these demonstrations, despite the fact there were some scientific reports advising against these demonstrations. Why? Because um, um, because uh, the virus was already there, and actually, in on March the eighth, the same day after the demonstrations, the government uh, actually seemed to give more importance to the to the pandemic, and then they start to enforce restrictions so 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 um, at the new um, i am saying this from the international uh, uh, media but the new york times uh, itself reported that after the demonstration three female ministers and the wife of the prime minister uh, were uh, tested positive of, of the coronavirus so there is empirical let's say proof that the demonstration probably uh, uh, helped to spread the the virus there are discussions on on whether uh, there was more or less scientific advice, but clearly there was quite a substantial scientific advice against the demonstrations. And nevertheless, the government seemed to give priority to the uh, uh, core constituencies of the left-wing uh, feminist uh, government, which were uh, feminist groups and left-wing groups who wanted the demonstration to take place. And as one of the manners 
set, uh, the demonstration set, uh, machismo kills more than coronavirus. Therefore, the demonstration should be allowed as it was allowed. And here you have the wife of the prime minister and three of the ministers who tested positive uh, for the for the virus. Okay, this this um, uh, this is one example from 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 the left. Uh, we have an example from the right, and if we move from the national government in Spain to the regional government of of, of Madrid, and again in this case is the uh, is the Financial uh, Times reporting about about it. Here you have the cover page of the second largest Spanish newspaper, and you have the right wing uh, president of the Madrid region who is in charge of the education and the healthcare. And, and 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 so on and she is here in this uh, you see in this picture that she looks like uh, uh, virgin uh, mary um and in this um but you would think that this is because of madrid is the most hit region because of the covid 19 and because of all the people who died uh, but that is not the case actually what she's saying is like uh every day that uh, every every week a uh, business is closing down so we need to open because our business and our community are dying the economic business so so this will be the death of our community so given the importance of bars and restaurants to the spanish economy on uh, the, the 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 region uh, headed by this uh, um, uh, right-wing uh, conservative politician uh, decide to reopen uh, and the Madrid Hospitality Association declare itself to be very satisfied with this uh, eco economically wise decision despite it was against uh, scientific advice and it was and uh, Financial Times in a very nice piece called A Tale of Two Cities they compare two of the most heated cities or two or uh, the most heated metropolitan areas in the world at one side of the Atlantic, New York, and the other side of the Atlantic, Madrid, during uh, the first wave of the or of the COVID-19, and they show how during the summer, uh, while Madrid they 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 uh, they pleased the pressure of the bars and restaurants, and they allowed to the reopen the interiors of bars and restaurants. New York, both Andrew Como and uh, Mayor Di Blasio, they decide to uh, actually to engage in a in a big big uh, fight against against uh, business uh, groups and, and 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 they they were really stubborn uh, uh, and they avoid the lifting of restrictions on indoor dining and uh, exactly uh, the, the the equivalent to the same association in Madrid of bars and restaurants they said that governor the uh, and um, Governor Cuomo and Mayor Di Blasio have erred in the direction of favoring the health over the economic side of the crisis. So in this case, they were not uh, uh, in New York. They they were not. Uh, uh, they, they resisted the pressure of of those uh, powerful economic uh, constituencies, and the result of that, again, according to the to the uh, to the to the Financial Times, is what well, you can see in the figure of the right how new york and madrid suffered almost exactly the same first wave in the second in the in the summer madrid suffered a huge uh, second wave probably as a result of reopening these indoor restaurants while madrid uh, uh, while new york uh, because uh, they enforce uh, uh, they put let's say health on scientific advice over the pressure of economic interest they uh, they were able to to contain the pandemic during those those uh, summer months. So so here I have shown you two examples, two examples, one from the left and one from the right of in highly polarized settings how uh, uh, governments might seem to give priority to uh, to their core constituencies over uh, scientific advice. That would be the second um, mechanism. And then uh, uh, we have a, we we like to underline a third mechanism through which elite polarization might lead to um, to to worse performance, uh, uh, worse government response against the, the the pandemic, and is that 
governments uh, uh, in highly polarized settings, they are more able of politicizing neutral scientific-based bureaucratic agencies in charge of the fight against the, pa the pandemic. So they might impose, let's say, populistic measures over expert criteria. And I would like to show you two examples as well. One from the, from the US, there is this nice report by the New York Times, when science is pushed aside. So the country with the highest scientific credentials in the fight against uh, the pandemic, which would be the US with the, no country has more scientific resources than the, than the US, but actually uh, uh, it seems that the, during the uh, Trump administration, science has been pushed aside. And a couple of examples, but probably that could uh, happen in many other countries, the FDI, F FDA, probably one of the most prestigious worldwide <laughs> bureaucratic agencies was, I mean, officials that were forced by, by the appointees of, of Donald Trump to try to uh, authorize unpro unproven coronavirus uh, treatments that Trump championed himself, but scientists uh, advised against, like, uh, hydroxychloroquine and the convalescence plasma. Uh, so, so both, both, uh, both cases. And the control uh, uh, at the Center for, the, uh, for Disease Control, uh, also political appointees, uh, they, they, they actually, in this case, successfully prevented the scientists at the agency from publishing a range of crucial guidelines and edicts meant to shepherd the nation through the pandemic, so recommendations of, of what to do, clear recommendations of, 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 of what to do. Therefore, the result is that decisions across the US about school openings and closings, testing and mask wearing uh, have been confused and too often determined by political calculus instead of uh, evidence. So the politicization of uh, the agencies at the top level have been detrimental in a, in a highly polarized setting like in the US. And again, uh, my favorite examples, uh, unfortunately, I would like to put them from another place, but I have to put them from, uh, from uh, Madrid. So no less than 15 high rank officials in the healthcare system in, uh, in Madrid have resigned or been fired since May the 20th, including the director of the regional public health agency. And uh, obviously, in, for many and various reasons, but a capital factor for their dismissal or their resign is the fact that they wanted to uh, impose stricter, more draconian measures to fight against COVID-19 and the uh, conservative president that I have shown you uh, before, she and her government prefer to prioritize the, 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 the economy or put ahead the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the interest of the, uh, of the, of the business, uh, of the business groups. Therefore, we, we, out of this, we build the following uh, hypothesis. The first uh, two hypotheses refer to the social division and two hypotheses refer to the, let's say, political division or elite division. Uh, on the social division, the, the, the idea that, uh, first of all, of mass polarization. I mean, uh, when there is more, more polarization and that we measure as difference in institutional trust between those who support the government and those who vote for opposition parties, the more they are far apart, the higher the excess mortality we should observe in the region. The second one is is more uh, is more well known uh, hypothesis already in the in the literature and is the hypothesis of social trust. We should assume that ceteris paribus, when there is lower levels of social trust, people don't trust each other, and government probably don't trust people. We should observe higher levels of excess mortality in the region, basically because I mean, like in many other things, fighting against a pandemic is a collective action. If people don't trust each other, they prefer to. Uh, uh, give priority to their own uh, interest instead of the of, of the of the collective. Two hypotheses refer to the political division. 
The first one would be uh, polarization. So the higher the level of ideological polarization among the political parties in the region, many regions have political parties. In other cases, in other is not the case, but the many European parties, regions, and we have data for the parties uh, that are uh, predominant in the in the in the region or they are in the uh, regional assembly, uh, measured in 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 two ways, measured in the left and right, but also measuring the level of party fragmentation. So if there are uh, many parties, then we should observe higher levels of, uh, uh, should be associated with higher levels of, of mortality in the region. I, am, I don't want to claim causality. I want to talk all the time about associations. Uh, um, then populism uh, um, as well, the higher the level of populism or the higher the level of feelings uh, uh, of uh, anti-expert feelings in the in the in the region that we proxy uh, we have several proxies but in in this version of the paper that i'm going to show you uh, the proxy is in the galtan in this uh, galtan or cultural dimension uh, uh, between green alternative and, and, uh, and liberal versus uh, traditional authoritarian and, and nationalist the more the the, the 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 higher the average of traditional authoritarian nationalistic uh, let's say anti-expert uh, anti-expert um, um, uh, anti-experts in the in the region the more we should uh, we should uh, uh, we should see the excess uh, uh, mortality okay these are the four main uh, main hypotheses but um, Judging from the experiences in some countries, for example, where there has been uh, quite a lot of polarization, like in Germany, where they, they have had uh, demonstrations and riots uh, and, and, and so on against, uh, and, and you can see at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, alternative for, for Deutschland uh, becoming a third or almost the second party in, in, many, in many polls. And uh, this Despite this, uh, um, despite this high polarization, Germany seems to have performed quite well. And one of the reasons, according to the chief biologist that we cite in the in the paper, could be that the, the levels of institutional trust were so high that let's say that uh, has minimized the deleterious effects, uh, the negative effects of of uh, polarization. So we include a fifth hypothesis with an interaction that says that, uh, well, uh, if there is high levels of institutional trust uh, uh, among the citizens, maybe that reduces the negative effects of political polarization on, on, excess, uh, on excess mortality. So if people trust the government, maybe they can forget or the, the, the negative effects of this uh, uh, poisonous uh, politics uh, are, uh, do not have so bad consequences in the fight against the, the pandemic. So, so what, uh, sorry, I'm going to show you uh, first here. Um, here we, we test uh, the first hypothesis of institutional trust and social trust. Uh, uh, we, we control for, for variables, we control because following the, some uh, work that they have done as well, we control for average life expectancy in the region because the aging population means that there are well, the coronavirus, coronavirus hits more that region. Uh, uh, GDP per capita as well, richer, richer regions, more interconnected, London, Stockholm, Madrid, and Milan, and so on, they suffer and they suffer more. Uh, population density, so highly dense uh, metropolitan areas, the spread is much easier, so we use that. And we, this EQI 2013 is that we use the, the index of quality of government, this index that we built with Nicolas uh, Charron for the European Commission uh, on, the, on the perceptions of regional quality and uh, um, uh, for uh, European regions. And this, let's say the level of quality of government, the best proxy we can think of for perceptions of quality of of government. And when you introduce this with other factors is not, uh, is not uh, is not significant. Uh, so, but what we see in, uh, highlighted in green is that the institutional trust dip. So the difference in institutional trust between government supporters and non-government supporters, the higher that difference, 
uh, interest, the higher the excess mortality in the in the region. And the second column, social trust, we see that the higher the level of uh, social trust in in a region, the more we trust each other, the more we are probably eager to follow all of us the recommendations and measures and the con and contagion uh, measures, and therefore the lower the level of excess. Uh, mortality. Then um, for the third and fourth hypothesis, we, we look at uh, in purple left right max difference. So the difference, the, the difference between the, the left and the right parties at the, at the parliament, a proxy for the polarization, ideological polarization. In the, in the region, the higher the distance, the more they are further apart, the left and right controlling for all these factors, there seems to be higher levels of excess mortality. Also with party fractionalization, although the effect is not so strong, so it's, it's barely significant. So the number of parties, one can assume that that could be a proxy of polarization. I, not very clear that it's a very good proxy of polarization, but a proxy that, the, that is a very divided political environment, and that seems to be also associated also to a larger extent. So the, the ideological distance seems to matter more, but the number of parties not, uh, not so much. And then uh, the fourth, uh, in this Galtan mean, that is at to which extent the parties in our region are more authoritarian, traditionalist, nationalist, anti-expert, anti-European Union. And actually, um, the one variable that I don't present here, but results quite significant is the attitudes towards the European Union. So attitudes towards the European, the more anti-European Union politics, the, uh, the, 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 the more the excess mortality controlling for everything. And, but the, we, there is no theoretical possible link between that. And what we think is that this probably the attitudes towards European Union are highly correlated, at least in some studies, with anti-experts. So the more you hate Europe is because you hate experts and, and so on. And, and, and so the, maybe that collects the anti-expert uh, um, sentiment. And, and also we, with this, like with this Galtan, we see a more correlation with, uh, with, uh, um, um, with higher, um, Higher mortality, higher mortality in the in the region, and then uh, the fifth hypothesis in in the same uh, uh, regression analysis, but highlighted in grey, are uh, the interaction between the index of polarization on the one hand and the level of institutional trust on the other. So, where there is uh, uh, institutional uh, uh, trust there's uh, um, the, 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 the levels of institutional trust uh, seem to reduce actually uh, uh, excess mortality or they, they, there is not so much negative effect on excess mortality uh, uh, of, of uh, variables of, of polarization, uh, left, right, or uh, party fractionalization. Uh, so, so, and also the, the experts. So the negative effect of uh, of uh, of um, populism measured by Galtan mean uh, the tan mean the higher you are in tan um, are are reduced uh, when we introduced uh, institutional institutional um, institutional trust. So uh, it seems that a highly trusting uh, uh, society in government can cope better with a highly polarized. Uh, environment. If that is not the case, if the citizens in the society do not trust much uh, government, in that case, uh, polarization seem to, my, uh, seem to kill you more, let's say, uh, or at least that is the association we find. And I uh, stop the sharing here and I stop my presentation and thank you very much for your attention and for uh, attention. I will be very glad to to hear uh, to discuss any comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, for this uh, very clear and well structured talk with also a very uh, substantial and original findings. So now we have about uh, 15 minutes for the uh, discussion. Uh, I see uh, one person on 
the chat function, uh, Professor Reichmann, who, who posted a comment. Um, so I give the, so if you have any questions, please j just, j if I can see your name on the chat, uh, on, on, on the chat function, I will give you the microphone. Uh, so, uh, Professor Reichmann, uh, I, I give the microphone to you maybe to, to comment or pose a question. Thanks. That was just generally a comment, not really a question and an observation that when you combine all of these factors with a contested election cycle in the United States, you, everything you talked about was attenuated. So that, that was just really more of a comment and, and maybe a thought about ways in which context could matter. That is, did it, does it matter that this, for the United States, for example, that you know, we are in the we we are in the midst. We were in the midst, or are in the midst. Actually, it's not ending, of a contested election cycle. You know, very hot, coinciding with uh, the pandemic. So I, I just didn't know to what extent that could matter, and if there's something you could put into your cycle. But I also have another question, and and that is this question of the absence or the lack of trust. And I've been thinking a lot about this as I've listened to lots of the conversations over the course of the week. Is it true that the folks who are non-compliant lack trust or do they have trust in something else? That is, they certainly lack trust in science, but are they replacing that with just fatalism or is there an alternative sort of trust mechanism that's really at work here? And that's sort of a I don't necessarily ask this a general question for the series, I think. Thanks very much. Victor, would you like to react? You are muted, we cannot hear you. Sorry, yes, no. Thank you very much, Nancy, for a very good comment. But just very briefly, I think you have given us actually a very good idea to, to test, which would be to try to include a variable on the time horizon of the government, uh, the, the, the months until the next uh, election they are facing, because it's very likely that the economic pressures that, uh, that uh, de Blasio or Cuomo or, or others were able to overcome would have been different if they were facing elections the very next months. So probably the combination between right-wing populist Trump plus uh, um, quick elections is the worst possible combination, but from there onwards we can be. So thank you very much. And regarding the trust, I don't know, but one thing that we mentioned in the in the in the paper that we don't I have not mentioned uh, in the presentation is that because also there are not very good measures, but I think and and a friend of uh, Yasin Jordan and I, who is uh, not uh, here, but uh, Ignacio Sanchez Cuenca from the Juan Marc Institute, he points out quite a lot about this. Is the idea that a lot of the problem is not people don't trust in, uh, lacking trust in governments, governments lacking trust in, in citizens. And, and then uh, we, uh, I put, we put one example in the paper, which I think is, is paramount. I mean, I, I, and I, I am here now in Sweden where the opposite has been the case with the, the approach to COVID-19 has been based on total trust of government on citizens behavior. And we will not ban anything. We will just recommend, but you, I trust that you will do what is best. But uh, we, we have one, one uh, anecdote in uh, uh, the chief epidemiologist in, in Spain, they ask him, well, experts are saying that you should not uh, close children's parks in big towns, especially because that is damaging for the mental health, or especially of the, of the kids of poor, uh, poor families that they, they, they don't have balconies or, and so on, small, they have to be locked down in small apartments. And then he said, well, if we could put a police officer in every corner of every park in Madrid, we would leave them open. Otherwise, not. So it is the kind of example of I, we, I don't trust parents. I mean, I don't trust people, and we don't. And we start with this lack, this mistrust, and probably both trust reinforces each other. But I think an interesting way of, uh, of future research for those who study trust. Well, those of you who study us much more to a larger extent than what I do is to try to measure the trust of governments uh, or trust of politicians in their in their citizens. Thanks. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Bat, Tobias, microphone is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Victor, for an, for an excellent talk. And thank you also for your for your nice uh, uh, illustrations of your of your hypothesis. Uh, um, uh, I always like that in your in your in your uh, uh, publications. Also, it's very lively. Um, I was wondering when you, uh, if I got it correctly, most of your hypotheses are really about uh, well political attitudes like trust, polarization, and these sorts of things. So I was wondering, um, I mean, of course, everyone can come with sort of a wish list of additional things to be included, but I was wondering, what about like the role of institutions? I mean, we all know that, for example, we, we, we talk about the, the importance of bureaucracy, about, you know, formal independence of bureaucracies and these sorts of things, or, or there may be different election rules, you know, I mean, there's diff very different uh, institutional factors that may, may play a role. And, and uh, if I got it correctly, you, you don't seem to put too much attention to those. So, so, so why not? And, and uh, if maybe, maybe that would be a good idea to include them. Victor, Thanks. thank you. Thank you very much. A very, very good question to, to, to Tobias. Well, one of the reasons is practical because one of the co-authors, uh, Rodriguez Pose, already uh, already have tested, and uh, some of them at least for the European regions. And then in his uh, in his uh, in his paper, what he finds is that there is no uh, well looking at the uh, quality of institutions. Okay, okay the, the quality of government in the region. So it would be a mixture of some of the variables you have mentioned, meritocracy, impartiality, and these kind of things. So this kind of mixture of the quality of government of the regions does not seem to be correlated with excess mortality in the first wave. Having said that, what he finds, and very strong uh, effect, and I don't know if, if he already has published it, but is that the decay in the quality of institution, again, coming back to Fukuyama and the importance of government decay and, and so on, the decay in quality of government seems to be highly correlated. So regions in Northern Europe, uh, in Northern Italy, sorry, or Madrid or other places where the, during the recent years there has been a decay, probably, I mean, um, at least in some of the regions, anecdotally, we can think there has been a decrease in the investment in public health. Um, um, th that that seems to be associated, but uh, but uh, that's that's a very good question. Anyway, we are exploring uh, on our own also some of these other institutional variables like the meritocracy. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I have next on my list is uh, Dr. Drain Philip, with a question and comment. Thank you very much, Yanis. Um, well, many thanks for the for the paper, Victor, which uh, I find really interesting. Uh, especially love that you make a link between um, polarization and uh, and the use of, of expertise. Uh, this is something I've been writing on, and I'm happy to see that uh, that um, you you have you have a similar argument there. I just have one perhaps a bit naive question about trust. Uh, related to, to mortality and that is goes as follows um so we see in research from epidemiologists that those who have the capacity to self-isolate um are less likely to die and perhaps there is a link between mistrust in others and distancing from others and uh, and and the death. So, if in a context where an individual does not really trust its environment, so other people will stay by him or herself, um, mistrust will lead to to a higher chance to survive. But if I trust my friends and I keep going out and hanging out and drinking, etc., then uh, then I and, and I trust that nothing will happen and everyone else is okay. I'm, and then I might actually risk to, to die. So this is one point. And the other point related to that is, do you control for um, population density, but not in general, but specifically uh, related to, to living uh, situations? So how many people live per flat, uh, et cetera, or per square meters, the, the possibility to actually self-isolate. Uh, self 
that would be something that perhaps could could confound your your, your finding uh, uh, about about more excess mortality rates. Great paper, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Philip. Victor. Wow, uh, very very good questions uh, as well, Philip. Thank you. I mean, first of all, I I didn't know about this possibility of the of the this let's say positive effect of mistrust. Uh, uh, um, um, and, and definitely, um, well, I mean, this is an empirical question uh, um, between this, let's say, positive effect of trust that we say and your neg the negative that you are pointing out and see which one. But to the very least, we should acknowledge that in the theory. So thank you very much. We will take that into account. And regarding the, the no, we don't control for the, for the families. We, we disregard that uh, too lightly. In the theory section, when we when when we talk about this, uh, that there are many cultural factors that are nation-wide. So in Spain, in Italy, and and so on, people share certain uh, uh, not only how many people you live with, but also uh, which is the distance to which you speak to each other, and if you touch yourself when you are speaking, and so on. But those cultural variables don't seem they 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 should apply to to regions like Madrid, where this huge density, but but uh, also to other regions in, in in Spain that have a far lower uh, mortality than uh, in the cold uh, Stockholm or the cold Nordic uh, countries uh, or uh, and so on. So they they there's, they they seem to be insufficient. But but we would like uh, yeah we would uh, we could introduce some of these uh, cultural um, um, factors cultural variables uh, um, available uh, thank you uh, thank you uh, we don't have much time left we have about 5 minutes so i will now give the floor to uh, david levy four and uh, Ethan address maybe uh, if you can uh, uh, ask your questions, make your comments, and then I will give the floor uh, to 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 Victor for his final comments. David. Sure, I would just say thank you uh, very much. E excellent presentation. What what are the alternative? Really, the alternative uh, uh, explanation? Um, didn't you make your life too too easy by not uh, really? Uh, going into the debate, theoretical debate, and then uh, looking for correlations. So this is the question, and uh, it was it came up in the discussion so far. Uh, Eitan, is it's now you? Yes, Eitan, you. please go ahead. Thank you, David. Okay, okay thank you. Just uh, a short comment. The questions of the relationship between trust and behavior is very common, but what we have here, and it has to do with risk management, yes, or risk assessment. How severe is the of being sick, and what is the probability of being sick? And uh, this is a perception of the individual, and it influences the behavior. But what we have here is a competing disruptions. We have the, econo the economical disruption, and we have the pandemic. Just to make it easier to analyze, think. Let's say that you have a tsunami at the same time. Will you keep social distancing? Thank you. Maybe uh, the final word to Victor. Yes, but if there is someone who wants to ask, I would rather prefer collect some. Uh, I, some I, uh, OK, good, but I see no one uh, so on my list. Okay. Maybe very okay. final opportunity to ask a question or make a comment. Or Doesn't seem to be the case. Please go okay. ahead, Victor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ethan and, and David, for for the for the questions. Um, um, I think um, um, actually we have a, a, a variable for coalitions that we didn't find uh, a significant um, a significant result, but we I will I, we will explore that more. And uh, re relation to the risk, um, I am not going to answer the question directly, but I'm going to connect it with uh, Philippe. And I, I think there could be uh, some relation between um, the tolerance towards risk 
and at least some measures. I, I get the feeling that um, um, these uh, Hofstede cultural variations and so on, it, I get the feeling that uh, seems to be highly correlated uh, with, the, with, the, with the responses, government responses, and in, in Nordic countries, very particularly Sweden, of course, that it would be the extreme where people accept uncertainty and, and risk, uh, they seem to have uh, gone much uh, lighter, uh, have uh, opted for a much lighter approach uh, than in, uh, in Italy or Spain or other countries where people might hang rier, hang, rank higher in uh, uh, uncertainty avoidance, that variable of, uh, of Hofstede, so they are more risk averse, let's say, and then they the same way they regulate the labor laws much strictly, they regulate behavior in, during COVID-19. I think there is a pattern of behavior. I would like to know whether Per uh, Legret agrees or not, because I think the Norwegians are pretty different from the Swedish, but to a certain extent, it, I think that they have not been so restrictive as the Italians or, 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 the, or the Spaniards. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Uh, I'm afraid we have to end the session now. It's, it's been a bit shorter this time, but uh, Victor has to go to another, to, to another meeting. Uh, we both thought that the webinar would start an hour earlier. Fortunately, we realized that uh, we, we, were, we were wrong. Um, so the, the, uh, thank you very much. Um, the next talk in the series will be delivered by Professor Valerie Braithwaite. It's going to be next Thursday on the 10th of December. And I think there is no excuse if you miss it because you will be spammed with reminders as usual about, uh, uh, about the, the, the seminar series. So let me thank you again warmly, Victor, David, and of course, all the participants in today's seminar. Thanks to you for your- Bye-bye okay. and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.